you're going to be um, discussing your experiment 14 data and the tables that we're going to talk about here in a minute. So you want to come to lab with the four tables I'm going to talk about completely prepared for the data you receive for the GC data for your group. Um, <coughs> we'll also do evaluations. We'll clean up the labs. We'll have you guys check out of your drawers. Make sure you bring your drawer key with you or $10. If you don't have your key anymore, it costs you $10. Okay? Um, so all of this is going to take probably a good couple hours, okay? So it's not just come in, check out of your drawer, and leave. There's going to be a couple hours of time, at least, um, in lab this week. Um, then your experiment 14, so your last report is due this week. Make sure you get from your lab prof when, when and where that is that you're handing in your last report. Um, then the next time I will see you is next week on Tuesday, Tuesday morning, 9 a.m. in here for the exam. So 9 to 11 a.m. Tuesday the 13th in here. Everybody will be taking the exam together. Um, please wait to be seated. Um, we're going to set up, so don't, if you get here early, don't come in the room. We're going to get the room set up and then we'll have you guys come in. Okay. So just wait to be seated. Things to bring with you. A calculator with memory erased. Um, no cell phones as calculators. Okay, so it has to be a calculator. Uh, a ruler would be helpful. And then make sure you have pencils and erasers. Don't try and do the exam in ink. Make sure you have pencils and erasers with you, okay? So what I'm going to talk about, first of all, is experiment 14. A um, couple um, notes about it, and then the experiment 14 data and the data tables that you're going to put together. Um, and then we'll go through the practice exam and go through all the answers on that, all right? So a um, couple things to note. Um, the tables are on page 14.7 and 14.8 of your lab manual, so the tables that I'm going to talk about here. Um, you're going to be looking at a couple different phenomena that are happening with your um, data, okay? So there's the carbocation rearrangement, so one bromopropane's carbocation, okay? So the propyl carbocation can rearrange to the isopropyl carbocation, all right? So you're looking at what's going on with that and when that is happening. You're also looking at what type of substitution pattern you end up with in your products. What is the product distribution that you end up with, okay? So there's two separate things that you're, you're looking at. Um, as far as the carbocation rearrangement, you can think of it as just that. Did the carbocation rearrange to make these products or not? For the substitution and what products you are making, you want to think about are they kinetic products or thermodynamic products that, that are being made and under what conditions those are happening. Okay? So kind of you've got to think of both different situations happening, they're happening at the same, same time. All right? um, so I have a set of data up here. Okay, here's the chromatogram from it. So it's A data, so we don't have a ton of products, but we do have products, okay? And so what we're going to be looking at is what's happening uh, with the data, and we'll look at, at the peak table for this data to get the information that we need um, for the tables, okay? So I'm going to go through in order, tables one, two, three, four, describing what you need to get out of the data. So this is just one condition example. So you're going to end up with tables, uh, especially two, three, and four, that have four different reaction conditions data on them, all right? So the first table is going to be data for your own um, GC information, okay? So it is just your, whatever you did your experiment conditions with, it's your information, all right? And so what we're doing is 
you're just listing information from your chromatogram and from your peak table for your specific set of conditions. So you want to have, you're going to have four separate columns. You're going to have a list of compounds, a list of standard retention times, a list of experimental retention times, and then the experimental percent areas, okay? Now, for the standard retention times, don't use these to help interpret your data. This data is from a couple years ago, okay? So this is not retention times that are specific for your data. Your retention times you should have received from your lab prof. So you want to get that data from your lab prof, okay? A um, couple things that are important as far as getting things identified. <laughs> With the standard retention times, um, the toluene will always be at 2.8 something minutes, okay? That's where the toluene hangs out. <laughs> then the isopropyl toluenes and the propyl toluenes are between the 7 and 8 minutes. They always occur in order. Okay, so don't change the order of occurrence. It's always metapropyl ortho isopropyl and then metapropyl ortho propyl <coughs> toluene. Okay, so even though some of the peaks, some of the retention times will overlap because of the um, error bars on the different retention times, they always occur in order. So you want to make sure you're listing them in this order, and that's the order that's on the list you should have got from your lab prop. Okay. Um, Dialkyl toluenes, so the one thing that's bad about the Friedel-Crafts reaction is it's really, it's great for adding an alkyl group on an aromatic ring, except for it usually doesn't stop at one unless you do something to make sure that doesn't happen, okay? So you will probably get dialkylated toluenes and potentially trialkylated toluenes. So the dialkylated toluenes are in the 13, to 16 minute range, they're roughly double the retention time of the monoalkylated toluenes. And the trialkylated toluenes are in the 20 to, in this case it goes down even farther here, down 20 to 21 range, and then this. This set of data had a peak at 26, which is kind of getting into maybe we've got the tet tetraalkylated, but it's not quite, quite quite clear. So I just labeled it as unknown. Okay. So you're gonna for all the peaks that you have above two minutes, you're going to label um, list all these peaks, label ones that correspond to standard retention times appropriately, and then list your dialkylated, trialkylated, and what your toluene peak is, then the experimental retention time, and what that percent area is. Okay, so this is all, you're not making any calculations yet, you're just listing information off your GC data. Okay. The next table, we're going to start looking at actually making calculations with that data, okay? So for this table, you're going to look at the breakdown of how much toluene was remaining, how much isopropyl toluenes was made, how much propyl toluenes was made, how much dialkylated toluenes, and how much trialkylated toluenes, okay? And so to do this, we have to recalculate information because we only want to look at the peaks that have to do with that information. So for this data, Okay, that is everything from the toluene all the way through the trialkylated toluenes. Okay, so we're not going to include this last number in this set of data. For your data, you'll have to see how that falls. Some of you had peaks in between your mono, your toluene and your monoalkylated toluene, so you're not going to pay attention to those peaks. You would only pay attention to the toluene, the monoalkylated toluenes die and try, okay? So to calculate these percentages, what you have to do is first of all, add up the peak areas for the peaks you're interested in, okay? So in this, with this data, it's this set of data that's bracketed in green. You have to add up all those peak areas, okay? So that's your new total peak area, all right? because we, we need to come up with these percentages. 
Then to come up with those percentages, you'll take the peak area for what you're interested in. So for example, toluene, we'll take this peak area, divide it by the new total times 100%, and that's how I came up with the percentage for the toluene. Okay. For the isopropyl toluenes, you'll add up the three of them, okay? Divide them by the new area, and that's the percentage of the isopropyl toluene. Same with the propyl toluenes, and then <coughs> trialkylated toluenes and trialkylated toluenes. Okay? So if you've done this correctly, for each column, you should come up with 100%, right? Because that is now the data that you're looking at. Okay? So you're going to have to go through and do this for your data and the three other sets of conditions. All right? So starting with this table, your information on this table should look the same as everyone else in your group because this is all going to be the same representative data, all right, now that once you recalculate it, okay? So make sure you clearly label that it is table number two, what compounds are involved, and then what conditions um, for experiment A, B, C, or D conditions. Okay, and then make sure you total it at the end to make sure it all adds up correctly. Okay, for this, this table? Okay. The next table, table number three, we're looking at the isopropyl toluenes. Okay, so this time we're just looking oops, at the three peaks that correspond to the isopropyl toluenes. So you will add up those three areas. That is your new total area for this table, all right? Then you will take each individual isopropyl toluene and divide it by that new area times 100% to come up with your new percentages, all right? So this, again, is just three areas you're adding up, and then you're taking the area for meta-isopropyl divided by that new area times 100%, same with para-isopropyl and ortho-isopropyl. And again, double check that at the end, it should all add up to 100% if you've done the calculations correctly. Right? And make sure, clearly specify the compounds, clearly specify what table it is, and then condition A, condition B, condition C, condition D. Right? Okay, the last table you're going to put together is for the propyl toluenes, okay? So it's going to be the bottom three monoalkylated toluenes, adding that area, those areas together. That's your new total peak area that you use for this table, and then divide each of those components by that peak area times 100%. And for this table, you should see information for A and B conditions. It'd be rare to see them for C, but you occasionally do get information for table D. Okay, so don't ignore it if you see it in table D. If you see it in table C, you could note that too, but that's usually pretty rare that you'd see it for, table, for condition C. Okay. But condition D, you do occasionally get information here, all right? And again, remember percentages, well, set up as the same compound, give the table number, each conditions, and your percentages adding up to 100%, okay? So then the questions <coughs> on page 14.7 and 14.8, after they describe setting up these tables, actually they're on page 14.8. You're going to need to go through and discuss in your conclusion the answers to each of those questions, okay? You don't want to list like question, you know, three, what the answer is, question four, what the answer is. You want to incorporate the answers in your discussion of these tables in your conclusion. So these tables should show up in your conclusion for experiment 14, okay? Um, and like I said, when you guys get together in your groups, 2, 3, and 4 should match up. Tables 2, 3, and 4 should, should be the same. Um, 
when you are looking at the answers to the questions or looking at the data to help answer those questions, don't always just look at one table. You've got to look at the, especially two, three, and four to help put the full picture together. Okay? So like if there's a case where you say, well, you know, there's this interesting product distribution for the propyl toluenes and it really doesn't make sense. We'll go back to table two and under those conditions, how much propyl toluene did you even really make? If, you know, it's a minor product in the whole thing, well, for the minor product to have this distribution, maybe it makes sense, okay? If it's not the only thing that you made for those reaction conditions. So don't look at each of these tables in isolation. Don't forget about going back to, especially table two, to look at your entire product distribution for the whole set of data. Okay. So, um, like I said, make sure you incorporate that information in your conclusion. The other thing you've got to remember besides the GC data is don't forget last week you should have taken the yield of your um, toluene product mixture. Okay, so you should have weighed that mass. Now that you have your GC data, you can go back and calculate the true percentage yield for your reaction conditions. So don't go don't forget to go back and do that. You'll have to figure out what percentage was product in your specific, um, for your specific experiment, and then figure out from that percentage what your percent yield was, okay? So don't, don't forget that part. The other thing to remember is on the GC, it has different conditions for um, running the uh, GC traces, like running the samples were run under different conditions for experiment 14 than 8 and 11. So you should write those conditions down um, in your lab notebook. Don't forget to get those because they are different for the two different sets of experiments. Okay. Questions on any of that? Okay. All right. So now we are going to look at the practice exam. gone through the practice exam before I before I post the key okay um, take note on this practice exam that there is a point of the exam for actually marking what section you belong to this is the easiest point of the exam don't forget it okay don't forget it people forget and it's a bummer because you miss your extra Extra should be easy point, okay? If it's not easy this week, figure out what lab section you're in, all right? A <laughs> um, couple other notes. If you take your exams in the Academic Success Center, I need to sign the paperwork for this exam because I am the one that's going to get your exams over to the Academic Success Center for you. So if you're taking your exam over there, you need to get me the paperwork ASAP, which I heard through the grapevine it was maybe due Friday? Yeah. yeah? Okay, so get it to me ASAP because we're now light, late, okay? Um, but see me if that is where you normally take your lecture exams, okay? Another thing is for those of you taking 256, your 
Um, there's a no, there'll be a note on here about what to do about next semester as well as I'll have a half sheet of information for you to pick up at the end of the exam. So don't forget to grab that information. Basically it's how, how to get started for the second semester. We will start just like this semester and the first week of the semester with, with an experiment. Okay, so I'll tell you what experiment to prepare for, okay? <coughs> if you have any changes with um, registration, please see me ASAP. Like, if you haven't registered for 256 or you have changes with your registration for 256, please see me as soon as possible so we can take care of that as well, okay? All right, on to the exam. Okay, so number one, we're looking at which of the following compounds would be soluble in hexane. We've got compound one, two, three, four, one and two, three and four, one and four. Thoughts on that? It's E, one and two would be soluble in hexane, right? Our two neutral compounds from experiment one. Okay, number two, which of the following solubility data is the best case scenario to recrystallize a neutral compound from experiment one. Um, 0.1 gram neutral compound soluble in 100 grams cold ethanol and 100 grams of neutral compound soluble in 100 grams of hot ethanol. Um, 0.1 grams neutral compound soluble in um, 100 grams cold ethanol and 0.1 grams soluble in 100 grams hot ethanol or 100 grams neutral compound soluble in 100 grams cold ethanol and 0.1 neutral compound soluble in 100 grams hot or 100 grams in 100 grams cold and 100 grams in 100 grams hot. Which one is the best option? B A, right? You want minimal amounts soluble in cold, <laughs> maximum amount soluble in the hot, right? So that when it cools down, it actually crystallizes. Okay. Which cyclohexane isomer below has, um, sorry, I'm falling off here into the fuzzy land. Um, which cyclohexane isomer below has both the chair and alternate chair confirmation that exists at the same strain energy? So we're going back to experiment two. Um, A, trans 1, 2 dimethyl cyclohexane. <coughs> B, 1 methyl cyclohexane. C, 1 cis. What, cis 1 2 dimethyl cyclohexane, D um, cis 1 3 dimethyl cyclohexane. Thoughts on that one? C cis 1 2 dimethyl cyclohexane have the same conformations. What about, so what's the same for trans? 1 3, right? Okay. Number four, which is not a way to increase the solid liquid extraction efficiency of trimersin into ethyl ether? Reduce the particle size of nutmeg, use less solvent, use multiple extraction, stir vigorously. What is it? B, right? You want to um, use as much solvent as you can per extraction to get as much out. All right, age number two. Pages are failing me here. Okay. In the flow diagram shown below, what is to be listed in number one and number two? So this should be a flow diagram for um, experiment one. Number one is sodium chloride. Number two is ethanol glycerol sodium myristate. Um, number one is sodium myristate. Number two is glycerol sodium chloride. Um, Number one is myristic acid and glycerol. Number two is ethanol and sodium chloride. Or number one is myristic acid. Number two is ethanol, glycerol, and sodium chloride. <coughs> Ideas? D. D. So you want the myristic acid is your solid, right? All by itself. And then the ethanol, glycerol, and sodium chloride are what are in the filter. <coughs> Where should the thermometer be positioned in the distillation head shown below? In C, right? Right below the arm of the adapter. Okay, so not up here or up there or way down here. That's C, position three. 
Which of the following correctly identifies increasing order torsional strain in the anti gauche and eclipsed conformations? So, what is the lowest? B. So, it'll be anti, then gauche, then eclipsed is the highest. Which of these is not a separation method? Distillation, vacuum filtration, reflux, or extraction? C, reflux. However, do you know what is involved in a reflux? So you can describe that. Okay, an unknown, extra additives here. Unknown compound is purified and experimentally found to have a melting point range of 99.2 to 101.3 based on the melting point ranges taken with compounds 1, 2, and 3. Which compound is most likely to um, be identical to the unknown? So unknown compound and compound 1 is 95.2 to 99.3. Is that a possibility? No, it's kind of low, isn't it? I mean, this is your... Your experimental melting point range, your mixed melting points, is pretty low compared to that. Unknown compound and compound 2, 98.2 to 100 degrees. That's a possibility. Or compound 3, 97 to 100.2. So B is the better fit, right? Yeah. Okay. D is your option. Okay. Compound with the following IR would definitely give a positive test to which of the following functional groups. Okay, you do not even need the frequencies to answer this, right? Okay, so you guys should be getting good enough at IR that you don't need the frequencies, especially when you have what group screaming at you? Alcohol. Alcohol. So what test should you use? Can and serocomonium nitrate. Okay. So you got to be good enough to look at it and approximate where it is, what's going on. Okay, here's the next one. We don't have a screaming alcohol, but what, what do we have? You've got things in two places telling you about this IR. So what do you have over here? Well, it's the SP3 or SP2 CH stretch, right? Hanging off there, okay. And then we got a C double bond C, so which test should we use? Potassium permanganate, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The rumbles did not sound like that, so I was a little concerned. <laughs> okay, so moral of the story on that one, know the frequencies of the key functional groups that we covered this semester. Hint, hint. Okay, when using a solubility test, the most, most polar compound is soluble in ether, but, but not water, soluble in ether and water, soluble in water, but not ether. C. C, soluble in water, not ether. Infrared spectroscopy identifies functional groups based on their C, C vibrational energy. Note the TLC placed below, the first one was taken one minute after combination of the reactants, while the second was taken 15 minutes of react after 15 minutes of reaction, which of the following suggestions are correct? So the product has been forming within one minute. Is that true? Yes. Here's your reaction mixture. So you have starting material one, starting material two, and a new spot there. That looks like you do have product after one minute. The product is more polar than starting material number one. Is that true? No. <coughs> starting material number one has a lower RF value. It's more polar than the product. The reaction will not produce additional product after 15 minutes. So at 15 minutes, here's our reaction mixture. Are we going to make any more product? No, because we've run out of our starting material number two. Okay. So, so far, one and three are correct. Starting material number two is the limiting reagent. Yes, because it's gone, right? So it's going to limit how much you're going to make. And then starting material number two has the lowest RF. No. So one, three, and four were correct. So B. 
Okay, thin layer chromatography, TLC, separates compounds on the basis of what property? B. B, B polarity. For the diels alder reaction performed in Experiment 12, what aspe aspect of the reaction allows us to visualize the TLC plates using UV light? C. C, right? So the diene always being as cis has nothing to do with it. The dienophile containing electron withdrawing groups has nothing to do with it. And the reaction was performed in ethylacetate has nothing to do with it. It is the phenol ring that is UV active. Okay, so that is the key. Okay, which of the following products can form in the diels alder reaction provided below? Okay, so here's, here's our reaction. Only one, only two, only three, one and two, one and three, one, two and three. Which is it? D, one and two, right? Because they are actually the same thing, right? Just drawn differently. What's the difference between one and two and three? What's going on in three? Three is not trans or what's, what's the other thing we talked about? Exo versus indo, right? Okay, so that's why three isn't a possibility. Bromination of ethylbenzene with n bromosexinamid is in the presence of benzoyl peroxide and refluxing hexane is an example of which of the following reaction types? E1, E2, SM1, SM2, or none of the above? None, which is it? What what type of reaction is it? Radical reaction. If a base such as sodium hydroxide was used instead of quinoline for the dehydrohalogenation of rom one bromyl ethylbenzene, which of the following compounds would be produced in addition to the styrene? So what would happen if we use um, something like sodium chloride or sodium hydroxide? So we use a nucleophilic base. What would you get in addition to the elimination reaction? Substitution, right? Okay, so if you're going to get substitution with OH group on the same carbon that you brominate, where is that going to be? Answer C, right? You brominated the benzyl position, so you're going to add a hydroxide to that position, or substitute in a hydroxide to that position. On the GC instrument used in organic lab this semester, how are compounds detected as they elute from the column? Um, how they ab absorb um, UV light. The ions produced when they are burned in a flame produce a current that can be measured. Ions produced are accelerated in a magnetic field. Ions produced absorb IR in the fingerprint region. It is B. So they are burned. The ions are burned in a flame and the current is measured that is produced. Okay, so we've got a student who's used magnesium, bromoethane to make a Grignard reagent, and then they added their aldehyde slowly, and they obtained their alcohol, and we need to find the percent yield, okay? So in order to find percent yield, what do you need first? You need the theoretical yield. In order to calculate the theoretical yield, what do you need to know? The theoretical yield is based on the limiting reagent. So you have to calculate which one it is. Now don't assume that the limiting reagent is what the limiting reagent was when you did the reaction. You have to go through the calculations, okay? So we go through, we calculate our magnesium. There's 0.23 moles of magnesium. With our bromoethane, there's 0.47 moles. With the hexanal, there's 0.18 moles. So what is our limiting reagent? Hexanal. So in this case, it is the aldehyde. 
okay? Just like it was for your experiment, but it may not always be that way, all right? So then we have to calculate theoretical yield, so the 0.18 moles times the formula weight of the 3-octanol equals 23.4 grams of alcohol possible, and the student made 20.4 grams, so 20.4 divided by 23.4 times 100 gets you 87% yield, which is A. So don't skip on doing the calculations. Run the calculations just in case, okay? That's why you're bringing a calculator with you, to run the calculations. Okay, what would happen if the sodium bicarbonate wash was accidentally skipped during the workup of the Grignard reaction in experiment eight? The residual water would not be removed from the product, um, and the product yield would be artificially high. The, Residual ether would prevent the alkenes from forming in experiment 11. The residual acid would cause some of the alcohol to dehydrate during the distillation in experiment 8 rather than experiment 11. The alkoxy magnesium bromide would be protonated so it would crash out of solution and you could not isolate your alcohol by filtration. What is it? C, right? Because the sodium bicarbonate is used to, res to neutralize the residual acid that you had. We didn't want any residual acid going into experiment eight because with the heat of the distillation, you would cause elimination. So that's why you did the wash. So, you didn't so the answer would be C. Now with <coughs> A, how do you get rid of water? Out of an organic layer of magnesium sulfate. Um, would the ether have anything to do with causing a problem with the alkenes? No. Um, and we weren't crashing anything out of solution with that alkoxy magnesium bromide either, okay? So the answer is C. Okay, so the next two um, questions, we're gonna look at this reaction here, okay? Toluene with two bromo propane in the presence of aluminum chloride. Which of the following carbocation species is least likely to form during this reaction? A, B, C, or D? D, why? It's a primary carbocation. We're not going to rearrange this guy to form this guy, right? Okay, two reactions were run in toluene, one at minus 20 degrees and one at reflux. At minus 20 degrees, the predominant product was propyl isopropyl toluene. At reflux, the predominant product was metal isopropyl toluene. Which of the following statements is true of the reaction under both sets of conditions? The reaction is under kinetic control. Metal isopropyl toluene is the thermodynamic product. The reaction is under thermodynamic control. Propyl isopropyl propyl toluene will, convert, will not convert to metal isopropyl toluene if subjected to the reaction conditions at reflux. So which one is it? B. Okay. So you should, that was a little pre-data pre analysis for experiment 14, but you should have similar results when you put your, your data tables together. Okay. All right. A student is following a workup procedure for the Frito Crafts reaction and is supposed to wash the organic layer with water. So we've got these four statements below. Which of the statements are included in the term wash? Add water to the separatory funnel containing the organic layer. Shake and vent the separatory funnel. Allow the organic and aqueous layers to separate in the separatory funnel. Drain the aqueous layer from the organic layer. So what is meant by the term wash? D, all of them, <coughs> including separate your layers and drain the aqueous layer from the organic layer. Which of the following is not a suggested means for initiating the formation of the Grignard reaction or Grignard reagent in experiment eight? Vigorously stirring the reaction upon addition of bromoalkane, crushing the magnesium metal with a glass rod, adding a crystal of iodine to etch the magnesium surface, warming the reaction flask with your hands. So which didn't you do? 
A, right? We didn't stir during the Grignard reagent formation, okay? All of the rest of those would contribute to Grignard reagent formation. A student needs to repeat the Grignard reaction in experiment eight and does not have clean glassware. Would it work for the student to wash the glassware with anhydrous acetone immediately before use? No, why not? What will the Grignard reagent react with? Acetone. With ketones, right? And acetone is a ketone. It'll react with ketones and aldehydes. So just like it'll react with water, it'll also react um, with ketones and aldehydes and would react with the acetone. So the answer is D. Which of the following would decrease the retention time of a sample in a GC? So decreasing the column temperature, would that decrease the sample retention time? <coughs> no, that would increase the retention time. Decreasing the column length, would that increase it? Yes. Decreasing the carrier, glass, glass, carrier gas flow, would that decrease it? No, that would increase it. All the above, no, and none of the above. So the answer is B. Gel permeation chromatography separates based on which of the following? Boiling point, polarity, size, solubility, and the mobile phase. So GPC separates based on C, size. Also known as, what else, is another term for GPC? Size exclusion chromatography. Gets the word size in there. <laughs> All right. We've got a story to read here first. Okay, one year in Chem 255, all students were assigned to make three octanol in experiment eight by two different routes. Half the students were assigned to use bromoethane and hexanel. The other half were assigned to make, to use bromopentane and propanol. So first of all, will both of those routes get to three octanol? Yes, yes, okay. All the group B students had the proper product which boiled within 10 degrees of 175 degrees, the lit literature boiling point for three octanol and it matched the IR spectrum for 3-octanol and <coughs> came at the appropriate GC retention time relative to the 3-octanol standard. However, the group A students all obtained a product that did not match any of this data. The GC retention time was several minutes longer than expected. So what does that tell you if it's longer? It's bigger. bigger, and what about the boiling point? Uh, Higher, right? <coughs> The, um, the boiling points the students measured range from 210 to 235, so it's higher. Their IR spectra did have a strong broad peak at about 3300 inverse centimeters and no <coughs> significant peak near 1700 inverse centimeters. So 3300, what is that? The, of, an oct of the octanol, what is that? The OH stretch, right? 1700, what's that? The ketone. So they did have alcohol, no ketone. But the fingerprint regions did not match the octanol. The product gave a negative DNP test, so what does that mean? No ketone. And a positive CAN test. There is an alcohol. The product did react with sulfuric acid to give a mixture of alkenes, but not the expected octenes. The alkenes produced alluded at longer retention times than the expected octenes. Which of the following could explain these observations? The hexanol solution actually contained propanol instead. Would that work? No, because it would be too short, right? The bromoethane bottle actually contained bromopentane instead. That could have happened, right? Because then you would have made bigger alcohols. Either the bromoethane or the hexanol solution was wet with water, quenching the Grignard reagent before it could make the <coughs> desired reaction. That one's not true because you do get alcohol out. 
either the bromoethane or the hexanol solution contained a lot of oxygen or other oxygen and desired 3 oxanol was oxidized to 3 oxanol before it could be analyzed. That's not true either, right? Because there wasn't, wasn't ketone present. So the answer is B. Okay, which of the following alkenes is least likely to be produced in experiment 11 if the student is assigned bromobutane and butyraldehyde as starting materials in experiment <coughs> 8? So bromobutane and butyraldehyde, what would you make? What alcohol would you make? For what? For octanol, okay? So what alkenes would you be expecting? What should be, where should the alkene, alkene be? At three and four, right? So the least likely of this list would be which one? E, right? Trans two octane, okay? All right, because you've got your trans and cis. If you have trans, you're gonna have cis. If you're gonna, if, and you've got through both four and three listed there. A high school wrestling team has the weight profile shown below. Which of the following statements is not true concerning the MN, MW, and PDI of the team? So player number 24 and player number 13 contribute equally to MN. That is true. PDI is less than one. False, because in order, well, you usually won't have a PDI possible of less than one, right? And for it to be equal than one, equal to one, we would have all these numbers would have to be the same, right? Okay, MW is greater than MN. Yes. Okay, we have product, we have distribution of weight, so MW is going to be greater than MN, which means what's what about the PDI? If MW is greater than MN. PDI is greater than 1. Player 24 contributes more to MN than to MW. Yes. Yes. So which is false? B, right? PDI is not less than 1. Okay. And the final question. And I'll talk a little bit about things to study, okay? Which of the following is a proper arrow pushing mechanistic step in the acid catalyzed E1 dehydration of a secondary alcohol? A? No, right? Your arrows don't go that way. We don't draw arrows that way, okay? We start with our electrons and go to the electron deficient area. We don't go from protons to where there's electron density, okay? B, is that a possibility? Yeah. Why not? For, for the acid catalyzed dehydration of a secondary alcohol, does it occur all in one step? No, so it is not B, okay? C, Yes, right? And D, we're not, we're not going, again, we're not going that direction, right? We lose water. It doesn't go that direction with the arrow. So the answer is C. Okay. So things to study for the exam. Quizzes, definitely good possibility, okay? Pre-lab lecture notes, definitely a good possibility. Um, glancing through your lab manual, now things to, to think about. We are not going to ask you, in experiment six, how much of this reagent did you use for this test? We're not going to ask you that question, okay? But you should understand why reagents were used in specific cases, why were certain steps carried out in specific cases, why things happened with each of the experiments, okay? So understand the how and the why. So other things to, to study would be your conclusions to your reports and understanding the how and why, so the background and what was going on with your results. Um, and then as far as the lab manual, like I said, going over, it's more the intro information is important than 
the nitty gritty in this experiment, you use this amount of this and this amount of this to get this. Okay. Know why those reagents were used, but not not how much of each one. Okay. Questions you guys have. All right. Like I said, I'll post this on Moodle, and I will see you all next Tuesday at 9 a.m.